Welcome to the next lecture in Bio120. Today we're going to be looking at how microbes grow and how we measure growth. This lecture is going to be a two-part. The first part is going to be recorded here, and the second one I'm going to give you directly in class, because it involves math and I want to actually work with you through the mathematics to have a more direct understanding of the subjects. So let's take a look at how we're going to be doing. We're going to be looking at how do microbial cells grow and reproduce. So we're going to be looking at cell division directly in microbes, which is going to be very different from the things that you have learned in Bio 110 concerning cell divisions in eukaryotes. We're also going to look at how we measure cell growth and what are the mathematics describing that kind of growth. So one of the big characteristics that all cells have it's their capacity to reproduce so basically how are they growing and as the cells grow they're going to have to double the amount of the macromolecules that they have they, they need to replicate proteins for the daughter cells to have they need to replicate their genetic genetic material the dna and their rna they need to make more membrane for each cell to have in the case of cells with cell walls like bacteria and archaea, they need to replicate those cell wall components. And of course, they have to produce all the organic and inorganic molecules that the cell needs in order for each daughter cell to have their own share. So in general, when we think about um, cell division, each daughter cell, when you have uh, a symmetric cell division, is going to get half the material for the mother. So half the material is going to stay with the old cell and half the material is going to be new material given to the new cell. So we're going to be looking that all biosynthetic events must be carefully coordinated so each daughter cell receives half the material when it divides. So let's take again a look at the prokaryotic cell and in particular what I want to show you is the nucleoid. The nucleoid is the structure shown over here as the condensation of genetic material in bacteria. It's an irregular uh, region. It doesn't have a membrane in the same way that a eukaryotic cell has. And as you can appreciate, it's directly in contact with the cytoplasm of the cell. What we're going to look is that during cell division, you have to think of a bacteria, in particular bacteria which are rods, though the same thing will apply to bacteria which are also cocci, that the, the cell division is programmed in three dimensions, and it has to occur in a spatial and temporal context. The DNA has to replicate, so each daughter cell gets the same amount of genetic material. We're going to look at the formation of the FTSZ ring, also called the Z ring, and how that formation is going to help separate the two daughter cells. But before this happens, the cell also has to elongate and grow. We're going to look at the DNA partition, and that is going to be aided by a complex of proteins found in a structure called the divisome, which is going to require, is, go is going to help the cell divide. And at the end, we're going to see the formation of a cell septum that is going to help the division between the two cells. And at that point, the two cells are going to separate in independent cells. So bacterial cell division occurs by binary fission, which basically it's the separation of two daughter cells that are going to be identical genetically in size. And it's going to involve the complex called the divisome. So for the cell to divide, you're going to have DNA replication, you're going to have cell elongation, and for cell elongation, you're going to require the divisome. After the cell has achieved its right size, the septum will form, and that is going to help separate the two different cells when the cell division occurs. And then the process gets repeated one more time. Now, a generation is a process in which one cell divides into two, and the time that it takes that generation to happen is called generation time. We're going to look, that, look at that more closely in a moment. So let's talk about the divisome. The divisome, it is a complex of proteins that are going to be formed in the cell during cell division. It is a process that is happening both in the cytoplasmic as well as the periplasmic region. And as you can appreciate for the bacillus shown over here, which is most likely E. coli, 
divisome complexes are dotted all around the membrane of the cell, where they are going to be helping generate new peptidoglycan layer and helping the cell form. Now, the FTS ring is going to form into one specific location, and that's going to be in the center of the cell. This image down here, it's showing the formation of the divisome complex that is happening along the width of the cell, not along the length of the cell as the image may indicate. So what we're going to see is that the formation of the divisome orchestrates the synthesis of new cytoplasmic membrane as well as cell wall only in the only in one particular region of the cell. The divisome is mostly formed by a protein which is a tubulin like protein called FTSZ and FTS stands for filamentous temperature sensitive. So these mutants were discovered with temperature sensitive mutations. It is a protein that is going to hydrolyze GTP to eventually form GDP and phosphate. And as the hydrolysis of GDP happens, the ring is going to depolymerize and shrink, and that is going to help separate the two cells. Another important component of the divisome is the protein FTSA, which is going to form a complex in the membrane. And that molecule hydrolyzes ATP in this case, to provide the energy for the divisome assembly and function. Zip A, shown over here, it's connected um, to the plasma membrane and it helps anchors the FTSZ ring to the membrane. Another protein that is important, and you already have learned a little bit about it, is the FTSI, which is the enzyme transpeptidase. And that enzyme is going to mediate the transpeptidation during peptidoglycan formation. Last but not least, we have the FTSK, which is going to help separate the chromosome during cell division. So together, the divisome is going to help generate the area where the cell is going to divide. Now, the divisome only appears in the center of the cell at the point that the cell is ready for division. What this image here is showing, which is from the previous book, but uh, the closer image is figure 5.2 in our textbook. It's showing a um, microscopic image in the top in regular optics, and then two microscopic images in fluorescence at the bottom. One of them in blue has DNA, uh, it's measuring DNA, and what you can see then, it's the nucleoid as it is starting to divide. The lower image in the middle in red, it's showing FTSZ. And the lowest row of images, it's showing the overlap of the blue DNA image and the red FTSZ image. So during the initial the initiation of cell division, what you can appreciate is that the nucleoid is in the middle of the bacillus and that FTSZ is distributed along the entire cytoplasmic area. So as you see in the overlap figure, both of them are present all over the cell. As DNA replication begins, you start to form an area in the middle where the chromosome is beginning to separate. In that same position is where you start now to see the polymerization FTSZ. Eventually, when the chromosome is completely divided, the FTSZ ring is formed in between, right in the middle, where the cell will divide. As the cell continues to elongate, the FTSZ ring now contracts, and that is mediated by GTP hydrolysis. And as the FTSZ ring contracts, it's able eventually to form a septum that is going to help the cell divide into two. So, what, is, what are the mechanisms that are telling the cell where the FTSZ ring should be assembled? And there are two mechanisms that cell does pur that purpose. Number one, it's nucleoid occlusion. Basically, a mechanism in which the DNA itself forms a physical barrier in the middle of the cell so the FTSZ ring doesn't form. So when the DNA in the nucleoid is segregated, that portion is going to alleviate 
nucleate occlusion, allowing for the formation of the FCA ring. But there's another system that is biochemical that is required, the mean proteins. And the mean proteins are involved in directing the um, physical location where the FCA, the FTSZ ring will form. And we have three mean proteins. MIN-D is a protein that is found bound to the membrane. MIN-D is going to recruit MIN-C, and MIN-C is the protein that directly inhibits FTS polymerization. But a third protein, MIN-E, moves in a wave-like pattern from pole to pole within the cell. So the main process of MIN-E, shown over here as a ring in the cell, it's to um, depolymerize the MIN-D and MIN-C dimers as they're starting to accumulate along the cell. So what happens is that MIN-E will move in waves from one pole of the cell to the next, and basically what that is going to do is to then accumulate the majority of min C and min D at the poles of the cell. So it goes from one side to the next. So that oscillation, it's going to keep the majority of min C and min D at the poles, but not in the middle of the cell. And because the concentration of min C and min D are at the lowest at the middle, that now allows the formation of the FTSZ ring in the middle of the cell and not at the poles. So together, the cooperation between the nuclear occlusion and the MIN system directs the formation of the FTSZ ring right in the middle of the cell. So this image here that is from the tubing lab in Germany, it's showing the, an example of MIN-D oscillation that is generated by MIN-E. So these are um, images taken of a bacterium at different timelines, and here the times are at seconds. What you can see here at time zero, most of the mean D is at one pole of the cell. And as time progresses, the majority of the concentration of mean D goes from one pole to the middle and then to the other pole. And the oscillation eventually continues to now go backwards from the right pole all the way to the left pole. So one entire cycle of mean the localization takes about 50 seconds. Here in the last panel to the right, you can see the DIC image of the bacterium that was being observed here by fluorescent microscopy. So min C and min D, because they're forming a complex, are being moved from pole to pole by the movement of min E. And that prevents the concentration of the inhibitory min C D complex in the middle of the cell and therefore that allows the formation of the divisome right at the center of the cell. So when the cell divides at the end, what you're going to have, as shown in this image, it's the min C and min D and nucleate occlusion working together to prevent the Z-ring formation. Eventually, by the effect of the removal of nucleate occlusion, as well as the removal of min C and D by min E, and you have an area of clearing in the middle of the cell where the FTSZ ring can form. That recruits the divisome proteins to assemble at that point. And then by the hydrolysis of GTP from the FTSZ nucleotides, I mean um, pro, uh, proteins, they are going to now form the ring that is going to contract. That ring contraction it's going to be also paralleled by the generation of peptidoglycan in that area because the cell wall needs to also be duplicated as the cell begins to divide. Eventually, the FTS zinc completes constriction, the membranes gets pinched off, and peptidoglycan layer and cell wall synthesis continues until you have an, a, a scission between the two cells that eventually gets separated once the peptidoglycan layer and the cell wall components are completely made, as shown here in the very last image of the slide. So then take a look about how the peptidoglycan layer is formed. 
So what we can see, in particular with gram-positive cocci, which are easily seen because the peptidoglycan layer is very, uh, very marked, is that the peptidoglycan, it's form, and it leaves a scar shown over here by these arrows where it was originally made. So the peptidoglycan layer is being made away from the scar in both directions, right here in the area where the cell division is occurring. So now the old peptidoglycan needs to be severed to allow the growth of new peptidoglycan. And that it's going to be part, uh, partly made by the formation of the uh, complexes by enzymes called autolysins. These autolysins are enzymes that are able to cleave the beta-1,4 glycosidic bonds between the N-acetyl glucosamine and the N-acetyl mucronic acid. But they do it in a very controlled fashion. They do it only at the area where the divisome is controlling peptidoglycan layer formation. And immediately at that point, new cell wall materials can be added to repair the holes made by the autolysins. And that is where the autolysins holes generated are fixed by the divisome proteins where the peptidoglycan layer is being made. This has to be tightly regulated because otherwise the autolysins are going to continue making holes in the peptidoglycan layer, which will make it very weak and therefore the cell will be destroyed by autolysis. So peptidoglycan synthesis happens in the area of the divisome and it is a process controlled by a lipid called bactoprenol. And bactoprenol is a hydrophobic lipid containing 55 carbons, is an alcohol, and during assembly, it's going to contain an M-acetylmuramic acid sugar bound to the five peptides shown over here as a green, as a pink little arrow, as well as a N-acetylglucamic acid. This is the peptidoglycan precursor that bacteriprenol is going to be able to move from the cytosol into the periplasm where the peptidoglycan layer is going to be formed. So bactoprenol, because of its high hydrophobicity, is able to transport the peptidoglycan precursor across the membrane into the periplasmic area. Over there, the enzyme transglycosidase is going to be able to fix and add the peptidoglycan precursors to the nascent glycan backbone, and the enzyme transpeptidase then is able to fix the um, peptide bonds between the glycan backbones. So you have transglycosidases that are going to fix the glycosidic bonds that are being severed through autolysing activity. And after this, you have the process of transpeptidation. That is the final step in peptidoglycan synthesis. The precursors, as you can see here, has an extra alanine. So we have an L-alanine, D-glutamic acid, dipicolinic acid, an alanine and an extra D-alanine. And over here, by the enzyme transpeptidase, you're going to have the removal of the alanine shown in green. And that removal, it's going to provide the energy for transpeptidation. So I have a question for you. Why do you think that ATP is not being used to provide the energy for this process? I have put here two uh, animations that are designed for you to visualize how the process works. Remember, these are just animations and they're not exact biological models of how transpeptidation and transglycosidation work, but to give you an idea of how the system it's, um, works and how the peptidoglycan layer is then synthesized by the combined work of the transglycosidation and transpeptidation. And as I mentioned earlier, transpeptidation it's mediated by the enzyme transpeptidase, and the enzyme transpeptidase is the product of the FTSI gene. That enzyme, it is the one that is inhibited by penicillin, and you can see the video over here as well of, that explains basically how penicillin is able to inhibit transpeptidase function. So I will stop at this point with the lecture because I would like to actually continue with this other part in class with you. So I will put this up. This will be the major part of the quiz. And then we'll continue with the next part on 
Tuesday. Bye bye.